Order and the sitting is resumed. It's time for questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. And we will start with listed questions. And could I inform members that question 14 has been withdrawn? I call Mr. Roy Beggs. Mr. Beggs. Question number one. The recently published Sony Air Grid Generation Capacity Statement for 2014-2023 notes that the generation surplus in Northern Ireland drops from 600 megawatts to 200 megawatts in 2016 due to the impact of European Union emissions legislation. However, the adequacy standard will still be met. There is agreement between Sony and the utility regulator that an additional generation adequacy of around 250 megawatts is desirable post-2015, and feasible options for securing this by December 2015 are being explored by the utility regulator and Sony. The, the developments in the Ukraine have once more put into focus the, the risks that exist uh, with our gas supplies and electricity generation. Would the Minister advise what action is she taking to ensure that we have a diverse uh, alternative energy supplies, such as are produced by AES in Karut, and that such generation would be sustainable and available in the future? Well, first of all, in relation to the developing crisis in the Ukraine, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, we have, of course, been in contact uh, with our Westminster counterparts, and at present, and I use the words at present because I think we all recognise uh, that things are uh, developing very quickly, uh, particularly in the Crimea, uh, but at present um, we're not aware of any issues in relation to the supply of grass, gas, not grass, gas to Northern Ireland, um, where we're totally reliant on our imports from uh, Great Britain. Uh, we understand that gas from Russia transits through the Ukraine to Europe, uh, but Europe is now less dependent on Russian gas than previously, and there are alternative pipeline routes which don't pass through uh, the Ukraine. But we are obviously and will continue uh, to keep a very close eye on the continuing um, issues in the Ukraine and everything that flows from that. Uh, in relation to uh, local generators, we do of course meet with all generators uh, right across the piece and uh, in the next few days I understand that uh, Sony and the utility regulator have agreed that Sony uh, will test the market uh, for provision of reliable power. Uh, or indeed demand side reduction or a, a mixture of both, uh, equivalent to at least 250 megawatts of generation adequacy. So um, members will see that um, testing of the market come uh, within the next few days. Thank you. And I call, I call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for answers up until now. Uh, could the Minister advise of any meetings that she has had with the likes of NIE or indeed the utility regulator in terms of increasing the capacity of the grid to absorb connections both from uh, renewables and indeed from other uh, prospective businesses that are attempting to connect into the grid to expand their businesses? Thank you. Well, we deal with this in two ways. We deal with very specific uh, requests from companies who perhaps want to expand and therefore need more uh, capacity in terms of their connection. Um, I have done that in a number of cases. I can't um, uh, name those out of the House because obviously that would give uh, an unfair disadvantage uh, to those companies if I were to name them. Um, but I can assure them that we have on a number of occasions uh, met with NIE or indeed my officials have met with NIE in relation to very specific cases uh, and I have one in my mind uh, uh, in particular at the moment. And of course we continue to meet uh, with NIE with the regulator in relation to the grid infrastructure in general and he will know um, from his chairmanship position that we are looking at uh, making an application to the European Union in terms of uh, is there anything we can do uh, in terms of getting money from Europe to try and help us to deal with our grid infrastructure, particularly in the west of the province, where a lot of renewable energy is trying to get onto the grid, uh, but at present uh, there are difficulties around that because of the strength of the grid. 
well, again, this is uh, the, the, the cost he talks about, and I accept what he says, because when you have a wind turbine on a farm and you're trying to make it um, a business case in respect of it, and then you go to NIA and you're told, well, that'll be a million pounds, please, to connect into the grid, uh, it doesn't really stack up. So, of course, we have had uh, meetings, correspondence uh, with NIA and indeed with the utility regulator, and he will know as a result of the last price, price determination that she did allow NIA to invest more money uh, into the grid. Uh, whether that is enough um, it remains to be seen, but that's one of the reasons why we have approached Europe in terms of trying to gain more money uh, in respect uh, of grid infrastructure, because uh, of course. Anything that NIE does is passed on to the customer, and if they are saying it has to be cost reflective, um, many times they are asking people to upgrade a line uh, because they are the first person onto that particular line that needs upgraded. And I accept that for uh, farmers and for others wanting to get involved in small scale renewable energy, it does seem to be a disproportionate uh, ask of them, and that is why uh, we continue to look at how we can improve the grid infrastructure, particularly in the West. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her responses so far. Uh, in relation to electricity generation capacity, Minister, uh, how important do you think it is to push ahead with the North South uh, interconnector to ensure uh, security of supply? Well, again, we discussed this matter uh, yesterday during the debate uh, in relation to uh, electricity. And, of course, the new high-voltage electricity link is essential to improve uh, electricity uh, infrastructure and network efficiency, thereby saving consumers in Northern Ireland an estimated £7 million per annum. Uh, it will enhance our long-term security of supply and allow generators here in Northern Ireland to export um, the electricity that they have to, uh, to the Republic of Ireland and hopefully uh, later to Britain as well. And it will uh, reduce constraints on renewable energy and provide access, uh, as I've said, to supply opportunities in the rest of the European market. So it is a critical piece of infrastructure. I do understand that NIE's revised environmental statement for the project uh, is with the Department of Environment, and I'm keen to see uh, the planning process uh, uh, progressed as a priority, including uh, a date set for the resumption of the Planning Appeals Committee, if required. Thank you. And I call Mr. Chris Little. Question number two. My department does not have a remit or statutory authority for the funding of post offices. As such, I have no plans to introduce a diversification fund for post offices in Northern Ireland. The Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister has taken the lead on cross-cutting issues in the Executive. I call Mr. Little for a supplementary. I thank the uh, Minister for her response. Uh, I had corresponded with the Office of First and Deputy First Minister previously in relation to this issue and had been redirected to the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. So I will, uh, I will, uh, I will revert to the Office of First and Deputy First Minister. Can I, can I ask the, the Minister nonetheless if she recognises that sub-postmasters as small business people are under significant hardship at this moment in time? Um, and does she support the sub postmasters protect our post office campaign that calls for an increase of government services to be delivered via post offices and would she help direct me to a relevant uh, government official who could meet with the all party group on postal issues to consider how a diversification fund has been used to help post offices in other regions of the UK thank you well, I thank the member for his supplementary, and just because I don't have any statutory authority doesn't mean I don't take an interest uh, in the issue, which of course I do, and I have on many occasions uh, spoke of the uh, fact that post offices provide vital services, probably not in the same way, but in a similar way in which credit unions do uh, in rural areas. Um, I am quite surprised, actually, and I think members of this House will be quite surprised to see the range of services that post offices already deliver, uh, and indeed uh, I think we should, and I've said this to post office officials, really uh, try and make sure that everybody is aware of the fact that they can deliver such a range of services uh, for banks, 
uh, for government departments um, and indeed uh, uh, for government departments here and also government departments uh, in Westminster as well. So the post office to me does play a very significant role. Um, I particularly want to pay tribute to sub-postmasters and sub-postmistresses who go way beyond the call of duty on so many occasions uh, to help local communities. And, uh, I can tell you many stories of people um, and the way in which they have helped local people in a very you know, unsung sort of way, if I can use that term. And, uh, I think that despite the fact, as I say, I do not have any statutory authority to deal with this matter, uh, he will find that I will be a supporter of his in helping uh, with the delivery of post offices right across Northern Ireland. The Honourable Commissioner David Hilditch. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and, and the Minister has touched on it there. But what, what government services are provided through the post office services? Well, uh, it offers a range of services for customers. Um, uh, government departments and councils, including applications, uh, payments, identity verifications, uh, data capture and information services. Um, for example, it manages more than three million post office card accounts uh, across the UK for people receiving uh, benefits, uh, state pensions and tax credit payments, and also, of course, offers uh, services related to driving licence applications, car tax, passports uh, and identity checking. Uh, when I spoke to the post office officials about this matter, uh, they went on to say that there was a very limited number of post office services actually being delivered through the post office, but they were actually facilitating so many other uh, agencies to deliver um, their services. And I think it's right that we acknowledge the way in which the post office is now being used by the banking sector, so that when uh, a branch closes down, that you can deposit uh, money through uh, your post office, and that's been facilitated, as I understand it, by the Bank of Ireland services, but it doesn't mean that only Bank of Ireland customers can use the service, as I understand it. There's a wide range of banks that uh, are using the post office to deliver services locally. Can I welcome the news this morning that I had a moderate increase in the hours open for Learmount Post Office, uh, one which the local community has uh, campaigned for for some time. But I'm wondering, is the Minister uh, particularly aware of various and what discussions she would have had with banks or post office, particularly in areas where branches of banks have closed uh, and that uh, reduction of service to the local community there? Well, it's one of the questions I can let the member know, Mr. De Principal Deputy Speaker. It's one of the questions I ask of banks, actually, when they are closing a branch in a particular town or village, how they're going to uh, facilitate their customers in the area. And often the answer comes back uh, that they are uh, uh, facilitating them through the post office, that they can deposit cash through the post office and that they can lift money through uh, the post office as well. And I am told that personal customers of 21 different banks. 21, didn't actually know we had 21 different banks, but there you are, um, including the Bank of Ireland, Danske Bank, First Trust Bank and Ulster Bank, so the big four, uh, and uh, across the UK can now use or arrange banking services within the post office. So I think, um, despite the fact that none of us want to see closure of banks, we should always look to see how our customers are, are going to be facilitated when that happens, and I think the post office provides an answer for that. Thank you. And I call Mr. Robin Newton. Uh, question number three, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. The member will be aware that the types of financial services that credit unions are permitted to offer are now a matter for the UK financial services regulators. Northern Ireland credit unions may apply to the Prudential Regulatory Authority and or the Financial Conduct Authority for authorisation to deliver serv new services to their members. The same requirement applies to credit unions based in Great Britain. I have, however, received recently a request for a meeting from the Irish League of Credit Unions to discuss a proposal for the introduction of a range of banking services. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer and I declare an interest as a member of a credit union. I wonder if the Minister would give me some of her thoughts on the potential of credit unions, in fact, to perhaps supplement where banks are actually closing down uh, outside of the, the Belfast area in particular, and whether or not she would believe that credit unions might indeed offer some services that are lost to a community via the closure of a bank. 
Well, I suppose this is a very similar issue to the one we've just left in, in the second question and around providing services when a bank closes. And a credit union can now apply to the particular uh, authority in GB uh, for authorisation to run um, current accounts or whatever. Uh, and that authority will then determine whether they believe that the capability is there to deliver on uh, that scheme. And um, we are here for our own part, bringing forward a credit union bill, uh, which will give greater f operational flexibility uh, for any credit union that wants to do so. And I know there are many in the community, and we've had the debate just last week about credit unions, there are many in the community who will look to the credit union movement because they trust the credit union movement and therefore they will want uh, to be able to do business through the credit union movement. Uh, so I would encourage any credit union who feels that they want to make that step forward uh, to make the application. We will try and support them as far as resources will allow in the department uh, to give support to them as we continue to do because we're still the registry. Um, and uh, as I say, I've received a request for a meeting uh, and we plan to have that meeting in the near future. Thank you. And I call Mr. Robin Swan. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I declare an interest as a member of Slimish and the Braid Credit Union? Minister, I know you've been very supportive of credit unions in the past, and the debate last week proved that. In an answer to me, the Minister of Agriculture has said that she has tasked her officials to see if there's any support she can give her, or her department can give to rural credit unions, maybe through the Rural Development Programme. Have you had any conversations with her in regard to that? Well, no, I haven't had any conversations um, in relation to that issue, but of course I would welcome uh, any strategic move to help with that because that would fall into, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, the financial capability which the executive as a whole, strategy which the executive as a whole is looking at and which has been consulted upon. Um, so I would welcome any move forward in relation to perhaps in her rural white paper uh, that she would look at that. But of course we should work uh, together on this to make sure that there's no duplication and that we're using uh, money in the most effective way uh, uh, possible. So I will, of course, now that he has raised the issue, uh, have a conversation with the Minister to see what her plans are in relation to the credit union movements. Thank you. And I call Mr. Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I welcome the Minister's response. And like the previous member, I do uh, fully support the Minister's intention to work firmly with the credit unions. Could I ask, similar to, to the member from East Belfast, given uh, the number of voids left by bank closures and exorbitant hikes in interest rates for, uh, for lenders and, and non-street lenders as well. Could I ask the Minister to give a firm commitment that it will be raised at the executive in terms of looking at programmes that would enable financial support to go to credit unions to fill that void left by the banks? Well, I think what I will say to the member is that obviously in relation to the financial capability strategy, which I think is the right place for this to sit, uh, we will have that wider discussion uh, around uh, education uh, and capacity uh, building, and I think it's the capacity building piece that he uh, may be referring to in relation to finance. He will know that in GB, uh, the government came forward, Department of Work and Pensions, I think it was, came forward with a, an amount of money um, to try and get more people involved in the credit union. But of course, it's nearly 40% um, uh, here in Northern Ireland. And you can see that reflected, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, in the number of members that get to their feet and say, I'd like to declare an interest as a member of such and such credit union. Even in this House, uh, we can see, and I would imagine it might even be higher than 40% in this House, uh, in relation to the amount of people involved in the credit union movement. So we don't need the same sort of stimulus to get people involved in the credit union movement. I do think, however, there's a piece of work around education and financial uh, capability through the strategy that the credit union will play a key role, and I hope the post office will play a key role as well. Again, I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I too would like to declare an interest in being a very proud member of Port of Ferry Credit Union uh, for a number of years. Uh, the question I would have to ask is along the lines of what has already been said would the Minister consider or indeed support um, a business credit union which would uh, be set up to help? Uh, not only to fulfil the void left by the banks, but also to help with small local businesses here in Northern Ireland to progress. I look forward to the discussions with the uh, credit union movement to see if that's the way in which they want to proceed. As I've said, we will give assistance where we can in relation to this subject to 
uh, resources, but I do think that they will have to apply to the appropriate authority uh, in Great Britain for their authority to do anything new or extensive. Uh, but they can do that, and I think the ability to do that is there now. And when we bring forward the Credit Union Bill as well, they'll have greater operational flexibility. Um, it's, it's, it is quite amazing to see the number of members, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, who get to their feet and declare an interest as a member of a credit union. I think that if the credit union uh, movement, either the Ulster Federation or indeed the Irish League, are watching, they can take great comfort from that. Especially the O's, much as I do. <laughs> the credit call, Mr. Alban McGuinness. Um, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Number four. I have asked Invest Northern Ireland officials to liaise with their counterparts at the UK Trade and Investment and Enterprise Ireland to formally assess the outcomes from the mission. Invest NI has an extensive trade mission of their own, with almost 70 events planned in over 30 countries up to the end of March 2015. Mr. McGuinness for a supplementary. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I um, thank the Minister for her answer and also congratulate the Minister on her involvement in this uh, unique joint venture by the British and Irish governments and the Northern Ireland, <coughs> sorry, the Northern Ireland Executive. <coughs> and uh, could I ask the Minister? Uh, to give her own assessment of its relative success or otherwise, uh, and what future plans might she have to engage in further joint ventures, which must be of benefit to both parts of this island? Well, I thank uh, the member for his question. And for my part, it, it was a, a successful uh, mission. And just today, uh, some members might have noticed uh, that I met with the High Commissioner uh, from Singapore, who is based in London, but he looks after the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland for Singapore. So he was particularly pleased uh, that his region had uh, delivered the first ever uh, joint trade mission, um, and he could uh, go down in history for his part uh, in it. Uh, but I think the success of the mission was really uh, in and around the fact that uh, the companies that were taken uh, from um, Great Britain, from Northern Ireland and from the Republic of Ireland all uh, complemented each other in what they were trying to do. They weren't competing against each other, they were complementing each other. So some were interested in servicing uh, the aviation industry, uh, some were interested in maintenance and repair, uh, and then of course from our perspective uh, we had our precision engineering companies, some of them represented uh, out there as well, and there were some leasing companies. So it was the mixture of companies, and I do pay tribute to all three uh, of the organisers, um, UKTI, Invest Northern Ireland and Enterprise Ireland for working closely together to make sure that that was the case, that it worked well uh, and that when the ministers arrived it all worked seamlessly, which of course uh, is always the challenge, when, particularly when the destination is so far away. So it was uh, a very good success and we now await uh, the outcomes to see uh, what the objective outcomes are and I look forward to receiving that information in the near future. Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers today. Can the Minister advise us on what opportunities and indeed challenges exist for Northern Ireland doing business with Russia? Well, <laughs> Russia seems to be a key theme today in question time. Um, uh, but uh, from my own perspective and from the Department's perspective, there have been uh, a number of looks at Russia to see what the opportunities are and uh, Invest Northern Ireland are bringing a trade mission, uh, God willing, <laughs> to Russia on the 3rd of June of this year. It's a multi-sector um, mission and we think that there are good opportunities for us in Russia and in fact the, if you look at the export figures in terms of Russia uh, they are continuing to grow at, at quite a good uh, rate. Uh, in terms of Tourism Ireland, um, Tourism Ireland industry partners are going to participate in Visit Britain's uh, destination Britain sales missions to Moscow, um, and uh, they're doing that to try and uh, sell the region, um, uh, Britain and Ireland, uh, together. 
And uh, I do hope that uh, the way in which we were able to work together, visit Britain and Tourism Ireland in terms of the Olympics, uh, that we can work together for the Commonwealth Games as well, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, so uh, that we can attract visitors from right across the world uh, to come and view the spectacle of, of those games. Um, but, uh, uh, can I say that we will continue to watch uh, and see how our government relates to what's going on uh, in Russia, in the Ukraine, but as far as we're concerned, it's business as usual, and we're planning these events uh, in the uh, upcoming months to bring trade missions and, indeed, Tourism Ireland to go out as well. Gail, it comes to Fran McCann. A pre last con, Corley, and I thank the Minister uh, for her answers thus far. Uh, would the Minister accept that we must explore every avenue and he could uh, for economic recovery, and can the Minister outline her approach to North-South economic collaboration? Well, I would imagine that that much is pretty clear uh, by now. We work together to the mutual benefit of our different uh, jurisdictions. I have always been very clear uh, that when it comes to the economic well-being of Northern Ireland, uh, I will work with anybody who can increase the economic well-being of Northern Ireland, and whether that's uh, east, west, north, south, or right across the world to some of the countries who we're now doing business with. And as I've indicated, there are 70 trade missions going to 30 countries across the world. We are looking for business, and we have to be looking for business because this must be an export-led uh, recovery, and that's certainly the strategy for Invest Northern Ireland. Thank you. And I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her responses. She has touched on the potential markets. Could she perhaps expand on what other opportunities may be possible there and what her department is doing about it? Well, as the member will know, the um, traditional markets have proved challenging over the past five to six years. Um, GB accounts for 60 per cent of all our sales outside uh, of Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, the GB sales do not contribute to overall uh, PFG export target, of course, because um, we're not exporting, we're still within the same nation. So it's everything outside of those sales. And of course, we did have uh, particular issues in relation to the Eurozone over the past five years as well. So that's why we've been looking to new and emerging markets. Um, and indeed, uh, our export target in terms of the new and emerging markets is to increase by 60% over four years. And we're currently on track to meet that target uh, with our 2012-13 performance exceeding the interim growth target by 13%. So we are looking at Russia, Brazil, uh, Indonesia, China, all of those countries that uh, invest Northern Ireland intend to visit in respect of their trade missions over the next year, and that's the sort of areas that we're looking upon for growth, export-led growth. And I call Ms. May McLaughlin. Question number five. Northern Ireland benefits from a large range of local economic data produced by the Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency and the Office for National Statistics. The quality and timeliness of official statistics is important and, ex and is examined through reviews on, of individual statistical series conducted by the UK Statistics Authority. User views are canvassed through general and expert user group meetings, consultations and meeting of the Statutory Statistics Advisory Committee. Balances often need to be struck between the wide range of user needs, costs, quality, burden on business and timeliness, and so improvements in statistic provision will continue to be taken forward with these balances in mind. Thank you, and I call Maeve McLaughlin for supplementary. Good Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, but given that there is a two-year lag on uh, GVA data in particular, has this been raised with the Office of National Statistics, and are there proposals to address this? Well, we do, um, and I just recently had a meeting with our own statisticians from uh, DFP in relation uh, to tourism statistics. We do obviously have a continuing engagement with the statistical people, but I think, uh, and I accept what the lady said in relation to the ONS, and it is difficult to sometimes get those in a timely fashion, but I think there is a balance to be struck, uh, making sure that we have uh, the information that we need um, uh, in relation uh, to the economy against the costs and the, and the quality and all of those other things. So uh, I accept uh, what she's saying and I will make sure that we will con continue our uh, uh, continued um, uh, talks with the Office of National Statistics and indeed DFP as well. 
Order, and that ends I'm afraid, the, the period for oral questions, and we'll now move on to topical questions. And as the first name listed has been withdrawn within the time frame, I call Ms Rosalind McCorley. And could I just also inform members that question four has also been withdrawn in accordance with the guidance. So Ms Rosalind McCorley. Diglom ear or an ira em ara, Kajem or Dori Shia I, or in the Sunri Falanya, the Kajanisra, a strategy economy actus Satohi. Can I ask the Minister to outline how she will address Nisra's new well being data and future economic strategies? Sorry, I didn't catch the second line, Matt. Sorry. Can I ask the Minister to outline how she will address Nisra's new well being data and future economic strategies? Thank you very much. Well, obviously that will form a part of our strategies. It, will inf it goes back to the, the, the last question, actually. The, better, the more information that we have from our statisticians, then we will be uh, better informed in relation to any strategies that we then bring forward from each of our individual departments. And that, of course, will form uh, part of any strategy, uh, as well as the other uh, statistics that we will uh, get from our statisticians. Thank you. And Rosalie McCarley for a supplementary. Is the minister concerned that data for the north is largely not available in the economic sec in the economy section? And what message does this send to our people regarding their economic well-being? Well, the information is available and is brought forward by our own department, DFP, in relation to the economy, and uh, those statistics are available. Thank you. And I call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Gurmagad, uh, Frio Kian Kolya. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask uh, the Minister um, if the findings into the research on Grade A office accommodation in Belfast in particular are available yet? and uh, to ask what the conclusions of that research into the availability of Grade A office accommodation is, in fact. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm not aware if it is available. Certainly, if it is available, it hasn't been made uh, available to me as yet. Uh, now that the member has raised the question, I, of course, will ask Invest Northern Ireland have they finished the review uh, into that matter. I know it's been a matter that has been raised with the member and, indeed, with the committee. Thank you. Mr McGlone for a supplementary. Yeah, well, I think the, the Minister has already answered that, and uh, if she could indeed give assurances that she could come back through the committee and possibly to myself as well, please. Well, I think it's only right that it should come back to the committee because the issue has been raised at the committee. So when Invest and I have finished their piece of work, I'm sure they'll want to bring it to the committee. And Mr Sean Lynch is not in his place. We move on. Mr David McElveen. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And the Minister mentioned a little earlier about her meeting today with the um, High Commissioner of Singapore. Um, obviously, uh, the, a major employer in my own constituency of North Antrim, Wrightbus, have done considerable business in Singapore already. I was wondering, could the Minister indicate did any discussions specifically around Wrightbus um, occur during the meeting today? Well, yes, we did take the opportunity um, to speak about Wright Bus, and actually uh, he'll be very pleased to hear that his MP, uh, Ian Paisley, has facilitated a visit to Wright Bus for um, the High Commissioner, so he has been able to go and actually view uh, the manufacturing up at Balamina, and I'm very pleased that he has, because Wright Bus play an integral part uh, to the innovation uh, in relation to their uh, national uh, bus service in Singapore SBS and uh, we're very pleased that they are a partner for Wright Bus and actually when I was in uh, Singapore we met with uh, uh, some Malaysians as well in relation to the opportunities there for Wright Bus so I do want to commend Wright Bus and the way in which they go out into export markets uh, and look for new business. He will know that Wright Bus had a difficult time at the start of the recession, but they settled down, they innovated, they looked at research and development, they looked at new ways of doing things, and they went out into the market. Uh, and I only wish that other companies would look to their example because I think they've done a tremendous job. Mr. McElveen for supplementary. 
And I, I thank the Minister for her very positive uh, response to my question. Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm sure the Minister will agree with me um, that when it comes to government investment, the return that Rightbus has delivered compared to the money that has been put in has, has always been exceptional. Uh, I wonder could the Minister just give us an indication or an assurance um, today that if Rightbus continues um, to require the assistance of Invest and I, um, that, that, that her door will be open to that particular request. We will, of course, continue to work with Rightbus and indeed other companies uh, like Rightbus who uh, continue to invest in research and development, continue to invest in the skills and management of their staff. Um, and uh, we will do so as long as the European Union uh, allows us to do so. Uh, and I think that that is an important caveat uh, because, as you know, uh, European Union are always looking uh, at how we help uh, our companies and indeed uh, looking at the state aid rules at all times. But we will, uh, um, as long as we can do so within the rules, continue to help those companies. Thank you. And Mr Ian Milne is not in his place, so I call Mr Alec Easton. Thank you. Um, can I ask the Minister what does it mean for the future of the Milk Cup with the announcement of new sponsors? Well, I think the first thing to say is that it will remain the Milk Cup. <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, that is a very important point because uh, when the Dairy Council decided that they were no longer going to uh, sponsor uh, the Milk Cup, um, and I have to pay tribute to the Dairy Council for being with the Milk Cup for so long and providing uh, a lot of sponsorship. Uh, it was very clever of them to approach Dale Farm because, of course, it remains then uh, the Milk Cup. And uh, I do welcome uh, the news that Northern Ireland's largest dairy company, Dale Farm, have stepped in uh, as the lead sponsor uh, because then it allows other sponsorship deals to come along uh, as well. And the partnership will guarantee that the tournament maintains its long association with the dairy industry. And I think there are a lot of very positive messages that will be able to uh, come out of that, uh, particularly in and around healthy uh, lifestyles and uh, young people getting involved in sport. Two very important uh, messages that I know, having spoken to David Dobbin, the chief executive of Dale Farm, he will want to deliver. And Mr Easton for a supplementary. Yeah. Would the Minister agree with me by this announcement that um, this could attract even more teams from even more countries and indeed increase, increase uh, bed nights right across our, our tourism industry across Northern Ireland? I think that uh, you know, when you get a new sponsor, there's a new invigoration um, to uh, a particular event, and I certainly hope um, the, uh, the Milk Cup has already established very much an international uh, pedigree and uh, I know that Dale Farm uh, have great plans for the future in terms of how they do business globally as well. So I hope the two will match up so that we can see even more international uh, countries come to Northern Ireland for the Milk Cup. Thank you. Mr Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I commend the Minister for her efforts in ensuring that there is broadband coverage uh, right across Northern Ireland, but indeed uh, also to highlight that there are some pockets, some not too far from this building, where the broadband bra bandwidth does not allow uh, commercial organisations to trade successfully. And would the Minister uh, indicate what she might actually be doing about that? Well, the member will be aware uh, from his um, uh, membership of the uh, City Council in the past that Belfast City Council were allocated funding of £13.7 million by uh, DCMS, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, uh, uh, under a UK-wide urban broadband fund. Uh, and uh, a proportion of that funding has been allocated to a voucher scheme under which businesses uh, and indeed the third sector organisations can access support to cover um, initial installation cost of a high-speed broadband solution. I think that is quite an innovative way of dealing with the issue uh, and I hope that everyone in the area that can access that are aware of the possibilities surrounding that and, and know that they can access that voucher scheme. And call Mr. Robin Newton for supplement. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I, I understand uh, exactly what the minister is saying, and that, that is an extremely welcome move. And I do know many organisations who have taken it up. As, as we progress in business, it's going to become even more important. Uh, could the minister indicate that she will encourage Invest NI to perhaps expand the service that they're offering and ensure that where there are blank spots? and to help commercial developments, uh, that, that, that Invest NI will in fact undertake that work? 
Well, I don't think Invest um, should be involved in, and I, I don't think he's suggesting that they should be um, involved in delivering uh, broadband solutions, but if he's saying that um, they should be involved in identifying areas where there aren't broadband solutions and then what are we going to do about it, then yes. I, I think for us to, be, um, to have the correct infrastructure to attract um, not just international investors, but investors who are already in the area and to stay in the area, we must have the appropriate uh, broadband connection for them. So I'm happy to say that that will be the case. Thank you. And I call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister, in relation to Tourism Ireland and the Northern Ireland Tourist Board, how does she recognise and assess the significance of their support for events in Northern Ireland, such as the Circuit of Ireland Rally? which once again is becoming a round of the European Rally Championship. Well, uh, I, I thought I hadn't heard from the member about the Circuit of Ireland uh, for a couple of weeks, so uh, it's good to hear of that again. Yes, indeed, um, and uh, the Events Fund had an application from the Circuit of Ireland and uh, have been successful, so uh, we look forward to that event um, coming in and around Easter, I think it's, it's normally Easter weekend. Easter yeah. weekend. There's a good advertisement for you, uh, Mr Dunn. Uh, uh, it is a great event, and I know there's a long history and culture in Northern Ireland in particular of car rallying, and we look forward to the number of tourists that will come uh, from all over to see that event. Mr. Gordon Dunn for thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I'd uh, like to thank the Minister for her support for the event. Does the Minister fully recognise the extent of the television coverage for this event and many other events, and how it displays Northern Ireland in a very positive way? This, obviously, the scenery from throughout the province is transmitted across the world. Does she really recognise the significance of that? Well, yes, I do, and I think that's uh, a very positive part of not only the Circuit of Ireland, and we're going to see that again because they're part of the World Rally Championships, and I uh, con congratulate Bobby Willis and his team on, on making sure that that has happened uh, again, and we're looking forward to all of the um, uh, drivers getting involved, in particular Gary Jennings uh, doing well again this uh, year from County Fermanagh. Uh, but I do also say that that's not only the only uh, sporting event which is getting that worldwide coverage. Of course, the Giro d'Italia, uh, when it is here, is going to reach 145 countries through the medium uh, of television, and then, of course, worldwide access in relation to the web. So this is our opportunity to shine, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I hope that everybody is ready to take that opportunity. Indeed. And thank you very much, uh, Minister. We've, uh, we've reached the, uh, the end of the list of speakers, so I thank you for your attendance. Is that the first time that has happened? And the House uh, will take its ease as uh, we have a few minutes. Yes. I'd like to apologise to the Chair and to the Minister for not being here for my topical question. Thank you.